Welcome to today's Melanoma Program, Diagnosis, Prevention, and Surgical Management with Dr. James Sheehan and Nurse Practitioner Natalie Mandalpo. First, let me tell you about our first presenter, Dr. Sheehan. Dr. James Sheehan is a practicing dermatologist with the Allegiant Health System. His primary office is at Bergen Mercy. He attended Creighton University for his undergraduate and received his Doctor of Medicine from Creighton University in 2000. He is board certified by the American Board of Dermatology. In addition to his many published articles and presentations, he has received many awards in his field, including the Excellence in Teaching Award from Creighton University, Department of Family Medicine in June 2009. He's also a member of several dermatological professional associations. For more information on Dr. James Sheehan, please refer to his curriculum vitae. All right, thank you, Teresa. And my good voice is okay. All right, so we'll get started. I thank you for having me in for the talk today. And I'm going to be presenting on melanoma. We're going to look at several aspects, including diagnosis, prevention, and surgical management. Uh, as my disclosures, I have no conflicts of interest and will not be discussing any off label usages of medications in this talk uh, for objectives. As you can tell from the title, we're going to improve your ability to identify lesions that you'd find suspicious for melanoma on yourself and on patients. I want you to understand surgical management techniques for both atypical nevi, that's irregular moles, and melanoma. And we're going to implement screening and prevention strategies for this skin cancer based on its risk factors and causes. Some basic background is important to have whenever we talk about any disease in the skin, and that are the layers of the skin. And there are three main layers. They're referred to as the epidermis. That's the very top layer of the skin. The dermis is the cushion upon which the epidermis sits. And finally, we have the subcutaneous tissue, formerly known as the hypodermis. Melanoma and malignant melanoma, I want to point out, are terms that are synonymous. And most frequently in the literature nowadays, we leave out the malignant uh, before the name because all melanoma essentially is malignant, so that's understood. And the term nevus I will be using throughout the talk, it means the same thing as mole. Uh, to a layperson, we use the term mole, um, but in the medical uh, lexicon, we use the term nevus. The other thing to bear in mind is what is cancer? And um, some of you may already know this, and it may seem rudimentary and simple, but I like to use this when I teach students and also explain things to patients. Cancer essentially is a cell that has escaped normal control. Our normal cells will divide when we need them to divide and then rest and no longer to divide when we don't need them to do that. Cancer cells will divide uncontrollably and thereby uh, replicate and grow and damage surrounding tissues. Now, the three most common types of skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma is by and large the most common, then squamous cell, and melanoma is the third most common, and that's, of course, the one that we're going to focus on today. Basal cell and squamous cells, being the most common cancers, account for more than 3 million cases per year in the United States. This is more than breast, lung, prostate, and colon combined. Annual cost to treat these is nearly $3 billion. Melanoma, though it's less common, can be much more devastating, as you'll see. Now, historically, on this, I want to give you a little background. It was in 1820 that Norris, pictured here, and of course not Chuck Norris, I don't have a picture of the original Dr. Norris, but he gave the first English language description of melanoma in the skin. And it wasn't until 150 years later that this was further refined. And again, no pictures of these guys, but you can use your imagination. Clark, Mim, and Breslow in the 1970s defined staging of melanoma partially based on depth of invasion. More recently, in 1994, researchers started to define links between melanoma and certain uh, genetic issues, particularly mutations in a gene called P16, also known as CDKN2A. This is a cell cycle regulatory gene, so it helps control proliferation of cells, stopping the proliferation when necessary and allowing it to progress um, when also necessary. In the case of melanoma, if this is mutated, cells replicate or proliferate uncontrollably. Now, the same gene, which is on chromosome 9, has been linked to familial melanoma syndrome, which is also associated with pancreatic carcinoma. Now, more recently, in this century, uh, Davies and colleagues identified mutations in the BRAF gene and suggested this as a target for therapy, and this will come up later in the talk. It's been, in some ways, revolutionary for what we can do for metastatic melanoma. Uh, 
Now, as the third most common cancer, it accounts for about 3% of all cancers from the skin. It arises from the melanocytes. Those are pigment cells in the skin. Though we see it most frequently in those with light skin coloring, patients with any skin type, even African-American, can develop melanoma. Uh, what's the prevalence? Well, 2011, that's the most recent data I have, there were over 100,000 new cases of melanoma in the United States. In my own practice, I will generally diagnose three to five cases per week, which is extremely high. This is more than I've ever seen in practice, and I've been um, treating skin disease for more than 10 years. Interestingly, it is the most common cancer for patients in the age group of 25 to 29, and rationale behind that is these patients are getting uh, less frequently things like breast cancer and colon cancer and prostate cancer, so the rate of melanoma compared to those others is much higher, but it is the most common cancer in patients in that age group. The number of new cases per year has been increasing rapidly. When you look at everyone in this country, the rate of developing melanoma in your lifetime is around 1 in 32. The incidence, in fact, is increasing more quickly than any of the other seven most common cancers. Now, the graph at the right is somewhat outdated here, but you can see how those numbers have dramatically gone up since the 1950s. In women less than 39 years of age, it is the second most common cancer, only more frequented by breast cancer. And patients who have a history of one melanoma, interestingly, are nine times more likely to develop another second primary melanoma. I've had two of my own patients in the last week uh, where I've treated, in some cases, their third or fourth and fifth, mel fifth, fourth and fifth melanomas in the same individual. Well, how do we identify melanoma? Fortunately, usually stands out, usually pops out from the skin. It's often brown or black in color. When you look at the most common areas in the skin, you can develop melanoma anywhere on your skin. You can even develop it sometimes in internal organs, though that's much less common, or inside the mouth or inside the vaginal area in a woman. But in men, the most common area is the torso, particularly the back, and in women, it is the legs. Though we certainly see melanoma on the backs of women and on the legs of men. Now, when we're trying to identify melanoma, and one is pictured here at the right, we use the A through E rule. A stands for asymmetry, B is border irregularity, C is color, D is diameter, and E is evolution, or change in a pigmented spot over time. So A, A asymmetry, draw a line down the center in any direction. The two sides should match up. If not, there's asymmetry. B is borders. We like them to be smooth. Here you can see jagged borders almost like a cloud. That is irregular. We don't like to see that. C is color. More than one color in a pigmented spot is abnormal. And D is diameter. We're looking for things larger than pencil eraser size. E I don't show on this graphic, but that's certainly the evolution. And generally, a pigmented spot that violates two or more of these rules is something that we're going to consider biopsying or removing. The tools that we use in the clinic. There are some other ones which are starting to gain favor, but they're not commonly used this time. But most frequently, what I use on a day-to-day -day basis is called a Dermalite or a skin surface microscope. And this is an extremely bright medical instrument, costs nearly $1,000, and it uses very, very bright LED lights to allow me to identify subsurface structures and examine them. And that frequently can help us decide to or not to potentially remove something of concern. Now, shown at the bottom right is what's called a woods lamp. It's a ultraviolet light, and I'll show you later in this talk how we use that. It's not used much in the way for diagnosis, but rather in helping us determine surgical margins. Now, one exception to that A through E rule, two exceptions, I should say, are nodular melanoma and amelanotic melanoma. Amelanotic, as you may be able to guess, means lacks pigmentation, and I will show you pictures of both of these later in the talk. Nodular means a lump or nodule in the skin, and these often are quite uniform. They may be very dark black in color, but otherwise they may not break the other rules except for perhaps evolution. Now at times, we'll have patients come in who have dozens, tens of dozens, or even thousands of moles potentially. Hundreds is not unheard of at all, at all. and frequently I'd say half a dozen new patients per week who come to see me will have more than 50 to 100 moles. Now, in looking at that background, oftentimes it can get difficult to decide what to remove, what not to remove, and this is where you may use the ugly duckling warning sign. And simply put, this means when patients have many moles, identifying those that stand out the most, that violate those rules the most, and initially sampling them. A key premise with melanoma, which generally is followed in most cases, is that radial growth phase is first. And by radial growth phase, I mean along the top of the skin, the epidermis and dermis. 
And at some point later down the timeline, melanoma can become invasive or have a vertical nodular growth phase. Exactly when that transition will occur is completely unpredictable. Now, there are three, four major clinical subtypes of melanoma. Lentigo maligna, superficial spreading, acral lentiginous, which means on the palms or soles, and this is particularly common in dark-skinned individuals, and nodular melanoma. And I'll show you pictures of each of these. They really don't have much clinical relevance. Um, when it comes to melanoma, the most important factor we're going to look at when looking at that primary spot in the skin is its depth. This is a woman I saw more than 10 years ago who was 97 years of age, and she'd had this spot on her skin for many, many years. And this is an example of what's called lentigo maligna. Now, lentigo maligna, um, uh, to a great extent, has been replaced by the phraseology melanoma in situ. And basically, this means a melanoma that is confined just to the very top layer of the skin. That's the epidermis. Fortunately, most melanomas we identify, diagnose, and treat are at this stage, and they are quite curable. But at any point in time, as I mentioned, they can develop that vertical growth phase. Here's another elderly individual with another melanoma in situ, or lentigo maligna. These are most frequently encountered on the head and neck region, particularly in the elderly, though I've seen some young individuals with them as well. A very large melanoma in situ. This patient I saw recently, and he'd had this for numerous years and finally sought treatment for it. And you can see in most of these cases how they clearly violate the asymmetry rule, the borders are irregular, we have variable colors, and they're certainly bigger than pencil eraser size. Here's a smaller lesion, but again, you can see the asymmetry, the color vari variability. This is another melanoma in situ. You doing okay? Um, ra radial growth phase, I mentioned earlier, and I want to show you an illustration of this. This is a very interesting case of a patient that I've been taking care of for a number of years. Well, as you can see from the date down there, he saw me around Thanksgiving in 2007, and he had this brown patch on his mid-upper forehead. Now, we had treated many other skin cancers on his face, including another melanoma. Just above his eyebrow here, you can see the surgical scar where I had removed one a year previously. But it's this lesion here of interest. At that time, we identified it. I took a biopsy and proved that it was an in situ stage zero early melanoma. The patient was fed up with it, having to be treated for these over and over and refused treatment at that time, understanding that progression was possible. There's the date there again. And here we have three years later, 2010, around the same date. And you can see how this lesion is dramatically expanded, but it's still in that radial growth phase. Now, at this point, he actually opted for treatment, and we were able to successfully remove this for him at that time. Here's another early stage zero melanoma on the back of a male patient I saw. You can see how large that is. It's over two centimeters in size. This is a 42-year-old woman. She's got a two-year-old little boy, little toddler at home, uh, works at a hospital where I do clinics, and she'd had this for seven years in the back of her leg. And this is uh, the back behind her knee, and it was quite large. Fortunately, it was also stage zero, or melanoma in situ. Patient I saw recently, well, 2012, and he has this brown patch on his back. This is another stage zero melanoma. Here you can see me using that Woods lamp to better define the margins. And what a Woods lamp will do is it makes things that are in the epidermis, the top layer of the skin, really pop out. So when you're going to surgically remove this, this helps you decide where to remove and what not to remove. Here's a patient with severe psoriasis. In the background there, they have an early melanoma on their leg, that black patch there. This is a, uh, a male patient with a melanoma that was a superficial spreading type. So this is a little bit deeper on the torso. I saw this patient at a local hospital about five to seven years ago, and he had had this spot for 15 years on his back, and his primary care doctor was just advising him to observe it. This is another superficial spreading melanoma, and you can see the gargantuan size. This gentleman, interestingly, actually has two melanomas on his back. I'll let you look there and see if you can pick them out. We've got a lot of sun damage here in the background, but this, of course, looks very irregular, and that is a superficial spreading melanoma. The other one that pops out here, though I don't have a close-up of this one, was a stage zero melanoma in situ. And you can see this is that more advanced lesion. I may have another photograph, not the only one. You can see the, the quite variable color there. This is a patient I saw recently who had had this on her cheek for a number of years, and this is a superficial spreading melanoma. 
And here's another on a patient's torso. And you can see the marked color variability. In fact, this has some blue-gray color. Sometimes that's referred to as a blue-gray veil. And that is quite indicative of a melanoma. Speaking of the blue-gray veil, this is a gentleman I saw in his 80s who had this on his arm for many years. And when we use that Dermalite instrument, that skin surface microscope that I mentioned to you, I actually have a picture that I took through the instrument. And here in the center of this lesion, you can see again that blue-gray veil, that kind of blue-gray coloration. And again, that's quite indicative. It makes you very, very highly suspicious that you're dealing with a melanoma. This is a woman I saw in her 80s who has another melanoma on her back. You see the very marked color variability, including the purple-blue color there. This is an 85-year-old male who is a retired realtor, spent a number of years outdoors, and he thought he simply had a bruise-like patch on his arm. And this, in fact, is an early melanoma that has developed a nodular or vertical component within its center that ended up being quite deep. In addition to being nodular, this component is amelanotic. You see how it's pink there? And you could imagine if you didn't have this background and just had that part, diagnosis would be more challenging, or coming up with a suspicion to do a biopsy would be more challenging. This patient was 55 years of age and had this patch for a number of years and only saw me once this component had developed. And this, unfortunately, is also invasive melanoma. This was about 2 millimeters in depth. And the background was simply in the epidermis or melanoma in situ. And next I'll show you a vertical growth phase illustration of one of my patients. This is an individual who is nearly 100 years of age, had this for an uncertain period of time on her foot, and at the time, though, we diagnosed her, did not wish to have treatment for it, understanding that progression was highly likely. Well, two years later, you can see what this has done. It's become a nodular melanoma. This is a Hispanic individual I saw about 10 years ago with a melanoma under his toenail. And uh, quite classically, when you see this, you might think, oh, it's just bleeding under the nail. But if the pigment <clears throat> pigmentation spreads out to what we call the nail folds, that's called Hutchinson sign. And it's quite, it makes you quite suspicious that you're dealing with a melanoma there as well. Here's a melanoma under the nail. And this one, in fact, was amelanotic. This is in an uh, individual in their 40s. And unfortunately, this one misdiagnosed uh, by another physician for a long period of time to the point that it had become much more advanced. And there you can see it protruding up um, from the nail bed from the side. So what's the problem with melanoma? Well, biggest problem is invasion and destruction of surrounding tissues, uh, and as well as that, metastasis, which means spread to other organs. And that may occur in up to 20% of patients who have this. The risk factors that make individuals more likely to develop melanoma including, include having multiple moles, especially more than 50 to 100 moles, and if those moles are unusual in appearance. A family history of melanoma increases risk, or a family history of atypical moles or nevi increases risk. Having light skin coloring, individuals who sunburn easily and tan more poorly. Um, certain very large birthmarks can increase risk for melanoma within the birthmark itself. And living close to equatorial regions. Now, there are, there are in some cases, precursor spots for melanoma. About 50% of melanomas will arise on their own. The other 50% will arise from a precursor spot. And these are referred to as atypical nevi. Now, when explaining these to melanoma, I, to patients, I do not like to use the term precancerous moles. I think that's a misnomer. I explain to them that they're not melanoma, but they're in this somewhat gray zone. You have normal moles, you have melanoma, and then you have these, which lie between. When the pathologist looks at them, they'll grade them microscopically in terms of their degree of irregular features on a scale from mild, moderate, to severe. This is an example of an atypical nevus. You can see it's larger than pencil eraser size, got some color variability and irregular borders. And here's another one, not quite as dramatically atypical or irregular, but again, it's a rule breaker. A troubling area is the back of the ears. I always um, make an effort to inspect the back of most of, my, most of my patient's ears at least once, because this is where things can advance without the patient's knowledge. And this was an individual been seeing me for a number of years and all of a sudden has this new spot, which is an atypical mole, atypical nevus there. Now, there are alternative pigmented lesions that you may encounter that can mimic melanoma. And I don't go into detail on this, but down here is what we call a pigmented basal cell carcinoma. This picture I showed you earlier in the talk, and it, in fact, is a melanoma. Here we have a precancer spot called a pigmented actinic keratosis. This is a birthmark called a cafe a macule, quite common. 
and completely harmless. The most common growth we see in dermatology is called seborrheic keratosis, and these are brown, rough, and flaky. In a given day of practice, I will see at least a few thousand of them. Here's a completely normal, innocuous nevus or mole, and this is called a dermatofibroma. It's a firm, scar-like growth that often arises after a minor injury like a mosquito bite. Well, how do we stage melanoma? I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. In fact, whenever I stage patients, I often pull out my little card because, you know, it, it is complex. And I'll also get into prognosis. We use, as with all cancers, the TNM system. T stands for tumor. And that is, for the most part, uh, for the most part, that will reflect the depth of the melanoma for all the way from a T0, or sorry, I should TIS, which means melanoma in situ, just confined to the top layer of the skin, to a T4, which is more than four millimeters in depth. And it also will reflect whether or not the, most, the melanoma has what's called a high mitotic rate, which means it's very active in terms of proliferation, and whether or not it is ulcerated or the overlying skin is broken down. N refers, of course, to the lymph node status, whether or not lymph nodes are involved. And M has to do with metastasis, or whether or not distant organ involvement um, is present. Once we have the data from each of those lines, we'll plug them into our equation here, and that can give us the patient's stage. It goes all the way from stage 0, which is simply in situ melanoma that is only confined to the top layer of the skin, to, of course, stage 4, which is any melanoma that is metastasized or spread to a distant organ. When we look at prognosis, prognosis lines, this is old data and, in fact, is changing, but this will show you overall prognosis over time, and particularly patients with stage 4 melanoma do have a poor prognosis. The interesting thing is there, has been some, there have been some revolutionary changes in this just the last few years, and that has to do with the new chemotherapy drugs regarding the BRAF inhibitors. I think Natalie later um, will talk a little more about that, so I won't steal her thunder but I don't have new survival curves. However, especially for stage 3 and stage 4, those, I think, are changing substantially. Causes for melanoma. What the main cause is, we talked about family history and that, and we'll get back into that, but we know sunlight has a major role, especially for the two more common skin cancers, basal cell and squamous cell, but sunlight has a role, especially for melanoma that arises in sun-exposed areas, the head and neck, I mentioned that melanoma in situ or lentigo maligna, which occurs more commonly in the elderly. And, of course, that's the case because they've had more sun exposure than, say, someone who's 18 years of age. To show sun damage, sometimes we can clinically see that. Sometimes we can use that Woods lamp, and that will highlight or bring out freckling in sun-exposed areas, which are indicative of the damage due to ultraviolet light exposure. So I mentioned already people with light skin color who tan poorly and burn easily are especially at risk from ultraviolet light. Sunlight, of course, is the major source of this, but we know, of course, tanning beds have a role. And in fact, at least in Nebraska, there is a bill underway in the legislature that is working to ban tanning in salons, um, especially in individuals younger than age 18. And there's a recent article from the Omaha World Herald regarding that. Um, a number of states have already uh, enacted such legislation, which is very helpful, and especially Going back to those earlier slides where you see that melanoma being the most common cancer in individuals 25 to 29, well, that age group and probably individuals younger are much more likely to be using tanning beds. So how does ultraviolet light actually do this? Well, this is, this is a complicated thing, complicated factor. Um, but we know that ultraviolet light, which is incident upon the skin, which interacts with the skin, has uh, the effect of damaging uh, certain cells in the skin. And here you can see UV light, and it's got a spectrum from about 290 nanometers to 400 nanometers. When it comes into the skin, it'll actually interact with the DNA and damage the DNA, causing mutations. And some of these mutations may lead to damage in the BRAF gene and other genes, such as P16, which then lead up to the development of the melanoma over time. Family history we know is important, and family history has a lot to do with the fairness of our complexion and also potentially uh, heritable mutations in these genes. We look like our family members, and looking like our family members, we're potentially more predisposed to sunburns. So how do we prevent melanoma? Well, ultraviolet light protection is very important, and I'd even throw in here that early detection 
is even more important than prevention. Prevention is something much more difficult, though it's being looked at more and more. For those who are at high risk, whether these be individuals who have already had a melanoma and are nine, nine times more likely to develop another one, people with a family history of melanoma, or individuals with multiple moles and fair skin coloring, we recommend periodic assessments in the office and at home. And I've been in practice in the Omaha area about 10 years now, and I have patients that I follow for a number of years who are in those high-risk categories but maybe have not had a melanoma as, as of yet. And over time, I'm seeing more and more of those individuals who are now diagnosing with their first melanoma. So surveillance is very important. Now, for at-home skin checks, especially our individuals who've had melanoma, we advise this being done uh, once monthly. Uh, as long as their birthday isn't after the 29th of the month, I will advise them to do it on their birthday. If they were born October 24th, I say, on the 24th of every month, you want to get in the habit of doing this. There are a lot of different ways to do it, but most individuals will find it helpful to have a full-length mirror and a hand mirror. And they'll literally get in the habit of going through and looking at every nook and cranny on their body. Certainly, if they have a spouse or significant other, they can help them in surveillance of hard-to-reach areas, such as the back. And unlike these pictures, it really doesn't have to be graceful, but this should take no more than five minutes. And really, the goal is for patients to get comfortable with what's there so that they know what's changing and what's new. And I have had a number of patients who've come in earlier than their planned assessment to show me something that was irregular, that was new and developing, that wouldn't have been picked up otherwise until they came in for the office visit. So how do we protect ourselves from the sun? Really, it's easy to break this down into three categories. Avoid, run and hide, and cover up. As far as avoidance goes, peak daylight hours are from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So we tell patients to try to minimize exposure. And of course, in Nebraska, in Iowa, based on the time of year, this might be 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., especially in the midsummer. Run and hide. Well, when you are out, seek to shade. Problem is, ultraviolet light can reflect off a number of surfaces, including concrete, water. If patients are on the water, on the river, on a lake, it's still advisable to cover up with sunscreen, wear tight-knit clothing if possible, long sleeves, and a broad-brimmed hat. Typical white t-shirt has an SPF of about three to four, so it really doesn't protect you very much, so they want to cover all areas where light could be hitting. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but SPF is something important to look at, and it's a ratio that measures protection from ultraviolet B light, but does not include ultraviolet A. The ideal SPF, now the American Academy of Dermatology until recently recommended a minimum of 15, I generally say 30 plus, and in fact, more frequently I'm saying around 45 to 50. In fact, uh, new legislation is coming out nationally that will enable sunscreen manufacturers to only say their sunscreen is 50 plus, but not anything like 100, because there's question about whether or not that's misleading to consumers who might think, if I put on half of an SPF 100, I'm going to have the same protection as I would with the 50, using double the amount. You want to look for broad spectrum sunscreens. And this means that they protect against both ultraviolet A and B light. The main active sunblockers sunscreens, which will do that now, are avobenzone, parasol 1789, and the physical block blockers, which are actually metallic. These include titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And when I buy a sunscreen, I look for a combination of active sunblocking agents in that sunscreen. So sunscreen, unfortunately, is frequently used incorrectly. Most individuals, studies suggest, use only a quarter of the amount the researchers used in determining the SPF. So if you start with a 40 SPF, you may only be getting a 10. Uh, I advise my patients to use two coats, one 20 minutes before they go out and another right as they go out, and reapply often, ideally every hour, especially if you're in water or sweating. In all skin surfaces, it's important to coat everything, especially the ears. I take cancer off ears so frequently, it's incredible, and a lot of that, I believe, has to do with not covering or protecting them. Same thing goes for hats. When you look at a ball cap, it doesn't protect the ears. That's why a broad-brimmed hat is best. Uh, next, we'll get into what I think is one of the more interesting aspects of the talk, and that's surgical man management of melanoma in these atypical nevi or atypical moles. When we have an atypical nevus, let's say we simply biopsy this, based on the degree of atypia, we may consider going back and removing more. And the parameters that I was trained to use and that I use are for a mildly atypical more, mole, Frequently, we do not have to remove more, but if we do, we may remove up to a two millimeter safety margin around that spot. For moderate atypia, we may remove three to four millimeters. Now, severely atypical moles, nevi, 
we're generally going to manage similar to how we treat an early melanoma. We want to re-excise, re-remove those with a 5 millimeter margin. For melanoma itself, when we look at those stage 0 melanomas, and I'm removing perhaps 2 to 3 of these per week, and again I diagnose 3 to 5 new melanomas a week, we'll use again that half centimeter margin up to a millimeter in depth. And this is measured, this depth is measured with a microscope. To a millimeter in depth into the skin, we do usually a one centimeter margin. Between one to two millimeters, it's debatable, but a one to two centimeter margin. And more than two millimeters, uh, most surgeons will do a two centimeter margin for removal. This is that patient I showed earlier. And here, because we didn't even have a diagnosis yet, we excise this primarily with a very narrow margin initially. This came back as in stage zero, melanoma in situ, so we subsequently re-excised to bring us up to that standard of care with a five millimeter margin. This is a patient that my PA, Amy Robinson, saw in clinic. She had a suspicious pigmented lesion here on her right temple. A biopsy has already been done. You can see where it's pink there and the biopsy is healing. This came back as a melanoma in situ. Well, the problem here is to take a five millimeter margin around this and close it's much more challenging. So in some of these cases, a more complex closure will be necessary. And in this case, again, we used a Woods lamp. I will use this in virtually all the cases of melanoma in situ that I remove because at times you'll really see where that melanoma pops out and covers a much larger surface area. This one stayed, for the most part, within the confines of what you could see. If you look at the picture before versus picture after, you can really see how it pops out there. And as I have the lights off in the room and the surgical suite, and have the, the woods lamp on, I will then mark out with my surgical marking instrument exactly where I see the boundaries on this. Once that's done, and there are the boundaries drawn, I will mark out a five millimeter safety margin in all directions. Now, you can see that requires me to remove the majority of this patient's temple. To achieve a closure, at times we may simply stitch, we may do skin flaps or a skin graft, or in some cases allow the areas to heal on their own. Here I've designed what's called a bilateral rotation flap. I'm going to make arcing incisions above and below and bring those pieces of skin into place. And I'll show you this step by step as we do the procedure. Here we are removing the melanoma itself, cutting around it. And this is what will go back to the pathologist so that they can demonstrate that we have clear margins and a thorough removal. Generally, especially for facial melanomas, we will mark out um, hash marks for orientation for the pathology group. You can see a double hash mark here at 3 o'clock, a single hash mark at 12 o'clock, and we make note to the pathologist on the pathology report. This is a specimen that's been removed and is ready to go to the pathology lab. Then going back to the patient, we have to achieve our closure. So here you can see me incising those flap lines, loosening up the skin, lifting up those flaps so that we can bring them into place. More of the same there. This is generally done under local anesthesia. Of course, general anesthesia, there are certain risks with that. I will take patients to the operating room uh, in some cases, but if we can uh, do this in the clinic, we prefer that with local anesthetic because it's much safer for the patient and also much less expensive. There we are loosening up the skin. At this point, those two flaps of skin are completely mobilized. Now, you have to kind of use your imagination here, but at this point, I'm going to be rotating these together. This is also referred to as an O to Z closure, and you can see why. This would be the O, the primary defect where we've removed melanoma is somewhat circular, and here's the Z as we're bringing it together and stitching it together. Initially, we'll do deep suturing down below the surface of the skin. There we have that Z or somewhat of an S shape, and there it's been closed up um, completely. And though patients will usually have uh, a substantial amount of postoperative edema or swelling around their eye for a few days, these usually heal extremely well. In fact, in some cases for surgical scar revision in patients who have unsightly scar, we will do what's called a Z-plasty, which is a similar type of procedure to somewhat hide the lines of that previous scar. Now, a procedure that I do not do is called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And to determine prognosis on patients, most commonly we're going to rely upon the pathology, but if we have a deep melanoma, melanoma that's more than a millimeter in deep, and again, that's the measurement that's determined microscopically, or melanoma that has a very high mitotic rate or is ulcerated, has breakdown of the overlying skin, we will consider sending a patient for this test. Again, it's called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And in this case, 
a specialist, generally a surgical pathologist or general surgeon, will identify that primary melanoma site. And you can see here's an example here. And around that primary melanoma site, they will inject a blue dye in a radio tracer. And that can be traced down to where the first lymph nodes are that drain that area. And you can see to the left of that picture where a lymph node has been identified and is being removed. Here's the melanoma coming out. And of course, this will then go for pathologic testing. And the point of this is for us to determine, has that melanoma already spread to lymph nodes? If there's lymph node involvement, immediately this will be staged up to being a stage 3 melanoma. And if that's the case, it may lead us to follow a patient more aggressively over time or perhaps even recommend chemotherapeutic options. Or additionally, in some cases, complete lymph node removal from that area called lymphadenectomy or lymph node dissection will be performed by the general surgeon. So with that, I'll conclude. I hope you enjoyed my talk. Um, we covered a lot today. And I would be happy to take any emails. Teresa will put my email up for grabs if anyone wants to shoot me an email. Have a great day.